This is about power and who is allowed to use it. All right, Jesse Earl, let's talk about the trailer for The Acolyte, which uh, got both a full-length trailer and a release date this last week, releasing on June 4th on Disney Plus is when we will just stream it. This is the new Star Wars series uh, that is being showrun by Leslie Headland. According to an interview in Hollywood Reporter, it's going to be a cross between Frozen and Kill Bill. Leslie Headland recently did Russian Doll, which was an mm. amazing show. And so I was already interested before this trailer came out. And let me just say, after seeing the trailer, I am now super psyched about the show. Now, mm. I, I, in general, am not psyched about Star Wars shows. But for things I'm going to get, reasons I'm going to get into, Leslie Headland is saying all the right things about why the show might be good. And I'll explain why in this interview that she gave with The Hollywood Reporter. That said, before I get into any of that, Jesse Earl, what were, was your reaction to the Acolyte trailer? Uh, I am in full agreement with you. I've been, I mean, I've, I've generally been enjoying the Star Wars stuff that has come up, but I, I don't necessarily think it's been particularly great and or aside. Like, I think Andor is the only one that's like unequivocally fantastic. One of the best TV shows I've seen uh, in the past few years. Um, but that aside, I, I've just been more and more like, oh, all of these shows seems to just be kind of milking the Star Wars brand. And while there's been elements of them that I've liked, uh, they've just sort of been based off of other Star Wars stuff, just trying to like, let's do an Obi-Wan show. Let's do a Boba Fett show. Let's play with the action figures. And Acolyte feels like what I've wanted Star Wars to do for a while, uh, be, with the only exception of it being a prequel, like I said, 100 years before. But beyond that, it is an era we have not seen before. It's characters that we have not seen before. It's trying to tell a story that's not associated with the Skywalkers or any of the characters that came from the movies in any specific way. So that all has me super, super excited. Um, I don't expect it to reach the level of quality of Andor, but what does? But I do, I, I am very, I have very high hopes for the series, especially as what I'm sure you'll get into is her her interview. So. Yeah, I mean, let me, let's just say this. First of all, uh, the cast looks freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just excited that K Carrie Ann Moss is in this and mm -hmm. she looks like she is kicking ass the same way that she was in the Matrix deck from decades ago. Like, mm -hmm. uh, Also, per casting as a Jedi, perfect for her. <laughs> absolutely. It's like she's born to play that role. So that's mm -hmm. really exciting. Lee Jung Jae, who is from the main character from Squid Game, obviously also... Uh, a brilliant and famous actor from South Korea in his own right prior to that. Uh, he plays a main character in the show as well, and it looks like he's going to be awesome. A man, a man, Lestenberg, uh, one of the main characters, obviously a big fan of her as well. So anyway, uh, Manny Jacinto in this movie. So anyway, really amazing cast, like a lo lot of great actors going to be in it. And so that in itself is really exciting. But Leslie Headland gave this interview to The Hollywood Reporter where she said a few things that I think are worth pointing out about this show. Do you remember when The Mandalorian came out, there was this thing called The Volume? <laughs> and it was really exciting because mm -hmm. basically uh, you, could, you could shoot and it looked like you were in the desert. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was not green screen. It was just a screen that literally looked like what the environment was in the background. Mm -hmm. And it was like, this is going to change cinema forever. Like, everyone freaking loves this thing. Uh, because, like, wow, look how realistic it looks. Uh, fast forward five years, and people are not as excited about the volume today. Uh, it, it, I think it has a very distinct look. I think we've seen the volume used very poorly. Mm -hmm. um, some, some people have used it well. Like, uh, example, Matt Reeves' The Batman. Mm -hmm. Excellent use of the volume, like beautiful looking movie, really gorgeous backdrops. And um, sometimes you don't even know that it's the volume that's being used. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, wow, that looks incredible. Uh, but I think more often than not, it looks bad. Uh, it, it looks rushed. It doesn't look like it's being used well. Uh, the question was asked of Leslie Headland in Hollywood Reporter, what's the Cliff's Notes version of your way onto this project. And she said, my elevator pitch was Frozen meets Kill Bill, which I said at Star Wars Celebration. Kathleen Kennedy bought it in the room and said, I love it, I wanna start working on it. And we did, we did a lot of development of the scripts. We had a really great writer's room. It took a while to get prep going because these are such huge projects and we did a lot of stuff practically in London. We didn't use the volume at all. <laughs> so it was a lot of prepping of the show, end quote. So it's just like, we went from the volume being like a revolutionary thing to being like, oh, don't worry, we didn't use that. Ugh, we Don't worry, mm -hmm. we didn't use the volume, you know, like. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that was notable. And the show does look like pretty good overall from the trailer. Jesse, do you have any thoughts on the volume these days and any any kind of opinion on it? 
I I particularly hate the volume. Uh, I've I it's not only been used in Star Wars, but I'm a huge Trekkie, and the Star Trek shows that are on right now use it a lot too. And my my big problem with it is like for a desert, it works great because the volume works wonders when you have a big, wide open mm-hmm. space with nothing around. And yeah. so deserts perfect for that. So I thought Tatooine, you're great, but yeah. when you go to like other places, it just creates these big cavernous, empty environments that feel very sterile. Mm-hmm. Like I, I there's an episode of Star Trek Strange New worlds where they are on this alien planet and they're sort of like working uh like cutting wood in some little area with alien people and it's just like there's just miles of mountains around them like what are they doing in the middle of this empty (laughs) field just hanging out here it just it just it it makes for very sterile environments so yeah it's been used very much as like a, a crutch that I have not particularly enjoyed. And, and part of the joy of something like Andor was they built those sets. They yep. built those, what was it? Uh, Narkina. They built the, uh, the uh, Fenrix. Uh, where is Fenrix? Ferrix. Built Ferrix. Like they built all of that uh, that set and it looked wonderful and felt very real and lived in as opposed to these big sterile environments. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hear that. The other thing uh, that, Les- I mean, again, Leslie Headland is like s- literally saying, Everything that would be necessary <laughs> to get David Chen into this show, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, she says the shoot went really smoothly. It was long, and th- there was, as you can see from the trailer, a lot of martial arts. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had an incredible stunt team that did some incredible wire work, and the talent did a lot of their own action. Uh, they said she also says, "quote We were obviously influenced by samurai films and wuxia films." But mm-hmm. also films like Rashomon, where you see one story and then you see it done a different way. So what separates uh, the acolyte from some of the other Star Wars series is that it's told in that particular way. And oh, uh, that makes me, yeah, and that, that's playing back from what George Lucas was originally playing from, like old samurai films as well. So yeah, and I think the closest we ever got to kind of a Rashomon style thing in Star Wars was uh, the Last Jedi. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Like, there was a really cool sequence in the Last Jedi where the same events were recounted by different people in different mm-hmm. ways, and I thought that was really. Really notable because it wasn't really part of the show until then, uh, part of the movies until then, as far as I can. Like, Darth Vader did kill your father from a certain point of view, kind of th- <laughs> yeah. thing, but like it, uh, you know, it was not shown Very explicitly shallow. on yeah. screen, right? Right. Yeah, um, yeah. One last thing about this interview that really stuck out to me, which is just mm, this is every Star Wars show creator needs to say this, but I don't think they're gonna after this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Leslie Headland said uh, the question was asked. I thought you made a wise choice by having a varied varied writer's room with fans of different eras and then somebody who never flocked to Star Wars at all. And Leslie Headland said, I thought it would be good to have the perspective of a person who had literally never seen Star Wars until she was in the room. And she said to me, why do you want me in the room? I've never seen Star Wars. I have no idea. I think there's a dog in it, but I don't know anything. (laughs) And And I was like, first of all, you're an incredible writer, but that's uh, why I want you here. I want you to be questioning narrative. I don't want myself, who's a lifelong fan, to just be relying on particular references mm-hmm. in order to create emotional beats. I want those emotional beats to be earned and checked by someone that isn't super familiar with it, end quote. Uh, I am read I, that am I in so heaven? Yeah. Have I died and gone to heaven? In terms of, you know, like, that is what we need in the writer's room for a s- series like Star Wars, and then to a lesser degree, Marvel probably, or DC. And Star Trek as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is somebody who is not familiar with the show who can tell you whether or not the emotional beats work on their own, because that's how they should work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesse Earl, what, what, what were your thoughts on any of this or your reaction to this trailer? I agree completely. Like, like that quote in particular had me the most excited for for the show. Uh, I, I, again, I am a huge nerd. Like, I love Star Trek, Star Wars. Watched, literally read a bunch of the books, read everything. But I get so tired in a lot of the franchises, and this is saying as someone who likes where Star Trek is generally now, is it relies often too much on like, hey, look, there's that thing that you like, or building up to that thing of like, here's the character where our arc is going to justify them getting to the place that they were in the movie that you saw. And so it's 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 like, I would rather you tell your own story that fits within this universe and, and uses the tools of this universe to tell the story that you want to tell rather than you feel like you have to just adjust yourself to fit this narrative arc of of the the franchise as a whole. Because I think that just leads to very shallow storytelling. It means that you, you're not really able to go into any depth. And I think it's, it's a big problem with a lot of the Disney era Star Wars where it's just going off of the shallow signifiers of Star Wars of like, oh, look, there's a thing that looks like the Empire 
rather than actually being like, what what did we want to tell? And it's why Andor was so powerful. It's like, we want to tell a very anti-fascist story. The story is about fascism, how to fight back against fascism. And hey, isn't it great? There happens to be a fascist empire in Star Wars that we could use to tell that story. Um, and so I think that that's, that's a much better way to go about it. And, and you know, I... I am. I think we should have more marriage of people who are super big fans and people who are not big fans of the thing that are uh, of franchises to tell stories. So I think that really can lead to uh, some good storytelling. So, absolutely, absolutely. So I'm really excited about the show. Uh, and I'm looking forward to watching it, and we'll be covering it right here on Decoding TV. Hey everyone, David Chen here. Thank you so much for watching that video from Decoding TV. If you want to get an audio version of the show, all you got to do is go to podcast.decodingtv.com. And if you want to support what we do, get ad-free episodes of the podcast and also bonus episodes of the podcast, go to decodingtv.com and become a paid member. Of course, you can also like and subscribe for more. We appreciate it. Thanks. See you later.